on World News Tonight. Extreme temperatures, severe heat wave engulfs Asia causing deaths and forcing schools to close with India becoming the most populous nation in the world. Massive settlement, Fox News settles with Dominion at the last second to ever defamation trial over its 2020 election lies. Espionage charges, there are increasing clampdowns on independent voices questioning the Kremlin. And blooming bluebells. Tourists flock to see the enchanted forest that lasts only for 7 to 10 days. This is Ada Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and you're watching World News Tonight. Now, India has become the most populous country in the world, with over 1.4 billion people leaving behind China. This comes as the temperature records are being shattered in countries across Asia as a brutal April heat wave continues to grip large portions of the continent with little relief in sight. In Southeast Asia, some countries posted their highest ever recorded temperatures this week week, while searing heat in the Indian subcontinent has killed more than a dozen people. Laos is the latest country to set a new all-time record as Luang Prabang reached 42.7 degrees Celsius over the weekend. Thailand topped 45 degrees Celsius for the first time in its history. Earlier this month, Thai authorities issued a health alert for several provinces as the heat index was forecasted to reach 50.2 degrees Celsius in the Bangna district of the capital, Bangkok. Neighboring Myanmar set an April temperature record as Kalewa in central Sagain region reached 44 degrees Celsius. The Indian Ministry of Labor issued an advisory to all states and regions to ensure the safety of workers, especially outdoor laborers and miners, in the extreme heat. That includes providing adequate drinking water, emergency ice packs and frequent rest breaks. Sri Lanka, Pakistan, India, Nepal and Bangladesh have all seen temperatures topping 40 degrees Celsius for many days. Extremely hot temperatures across South and Southeast Asia are expected to continue. A new report on climate change adaptation, the first of its kind to be issued by the Korean government, raises the alarm on warmer temperatures, saying that the nation's climate is warming at a faster pace than ever before on a global average. South Korea's climate is warming at a faster rate than the global average. From 1912 to 2020, the average annual temperature in South Korea has increased by approximately 1.6 degrees Celsius, surpassing the global average of 1.09 degrees Celsius. This is according to the Ministry of Environment's report released Tuesday on the nation's sustained efforts and actions toward climate adaptation. Titled The Republic of Korea's Adaptation Communication, the report serves as the first of its kind submitted by Korea to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change as required by the Paris Agreement, an international treaty on climate change signed in 2015. The report notes that from 1968 to 2017, the sea level temperature in South Korea has risen by 1.23 degrees. This is 2.6 times greater than the global average of 0.48 degrees. The sea level from 1989 to 2018 has also risen by an annual average of 2.97 millimeters, surpassing the global average annual rise of 1.7 millimeters. To adapt to such change, South Korea has established a multitude of legal frameworks, policies and institutional arrangements. Following the nation's first legal framework for climate change adaptation, enacted in 2010, the Framework Act on Low Carbon, Green Growth, in 2021, the Framework Act on Carbon Neutrality and Green Growth for Coping with Climate Crisis was passed, with enforcement to begin a year later. The law requires the central government to monitor climate change and implement adaptation plans. The nation has also developed what's called the Master Plan on Carbon Neutrality and Green Growth, which provides guidelines for responding to climate change until the year 2050. Meanwhile, South Korea is actively sharing its experience in implementing effective adaptation plans. The Ministry of Environment, in its report, reaffirmed South Korea's commitment to working with the international community in achieving the global goal on adaptation established under the Paris Agreement. Half the hospitals in Sudan's capital are out of action due to intensifying clashes, even as the number of casualties rise with many of the injured in dire need of medical attention. 
The sound of explosions. The sight of low-flying fighter jets. This is what it's been like for Sudan's residents since fighting broke out between warring factions on Saturday. It's become a situation described by the UN as a humanitarian catastrophe. This former security advisor says the country's never seen anything like it. You cannot even compare it to previous unrest, he says. There was no enemy back then. It's the first time that two military forces are fighting inside the cities. He says the houses of civilians are being hit, even as this interview is being recorded. On Tuesday, a planned 24-hour ceasefire came into effect. It was shattered shortly after the deadline, the sounds of fighting echoing again into the night. Leading up to the ceasefire, conditions appeared to be getting worse. This was a line outside the only bakery still operating in an area of North Khartoum on Tuesday. It's the only bakery for six neighborhoods, says this resident, adding that there is no water or electricity. The supermarket is busy and looks like items are in stock, but not with the products people are looking for, said this shopper. <laughs> Dentist Motaz Suleiman says he's most worried about the continued absence of main services like water and electricity, especially during Ramadan when it is needed most, he says. Now, there is a dramatic end to the explosive lawsuit between Fox News and Dominion Voting Systems, with the two sides reaching a settlement just hours after the jury was sworn in. Fox News reached a last-second settlement, agreeing to pay more than $787 million to end a colossal two-year legal battle that publicly shredded the right-wing network's credibility. Fox News on Tuesday agreed to pay more than three quarters of a billion dollars to Dominion Voting Systems, settling a lawsuit over false claims the network aired about the voting machine maker during the 2020 U.S. presidential election. Dominion lawyers had accused the conservative media giant of knowingly promoting the false claim that its voting machines had been rigged to switch votes from Republican Donald Trump to Democrat Joe Biden. Dominion CEO John Polis on Tuesday said the lawsuit had allowed the truth to come out. Fox has admitted to telling lies about Dominion that caused enormous damage to my company, our employees, and the customers that we serve. Nothing can ever make up for that. Throughout this process, we have sought accountability and believe the evidence brought to light through this case underscores the consequences of spreading lies. In a statement, Fox said it was pleased to have reached an amicable settlement, writing, quote, We acknowledge the court's rulings finding certain claims about Dominion to be false. This settlement reflects Fox's continued commitment to the highest journalistic standards. The 11th hour settlement came the same day a jury was seated and as opening arguments in the trial were set to begin. At a pretrial hearing, the judge had ruled that the claims aired by Fox were untrue, a jury would have been asked to decide whether the network was guilty of defamation. The deal spares Fox the peril of having some of its best-known figures called to the witness stand and subjected to potentially withering questioning. Potential witnesses included Rupert Murdoch, the 92-year-old media mogul who serves as Fox Corp chairman, as well as on-air hosts including Tucker Carlson, Sean Hannity, and Janine Pirro. Fox faces additional legal challenges, Another U.S. voting technology company, Smartmatic, is pursuing its own defamation lawsuit, seeking $2.7 billion in damages in a New York state court. It's been nearly a week since North Korea test-fired what it called a new solid-fuel intercontinental ballistic missile, a development that puts the United States forces, Korea and Washington, on high alert. At a hearing, the commander of the United States forces told American lawmakers that the Kim Jong-un regime is capable of striking the U.S. capital and beyond. Commander of the U.S. Forces Korea, General Paul LaCamera, has warned that the Kim Jong-un regime in North Korea has developed military might capable of striking Seoul, Tokyo, Washington, and beyond. 
at a House Armed Services Committee hearing on national security challenges in the Indo-Pacific, La Camera told American lawmakers on Tuesday that the priority of the USFK is to protect the U.S. and its allies, stressing that the United States' alliance with South Korea has deterred Pyongyang from waging war for nearly seven decades and helped South Korea develop into a prosperous democracy. Taking into account the North's evolving nuclear and missile threats, though, he highlighted the need to strengthen the alliance, saying that the U.S. must never take it for granted as its center of gravity in deterring the Kim regime, and that the Korean War taught the U.S. that it must always be ready and forward postured with its allies to ensure continued peace and stability on the peninsula. The general reassured the committee, however, that the joint forces are ready should Pyongyang increase hostilities. But regarding what's believed to be a new solid fuel intercontinental ballistic missile the North test fired last week, Le Camera said that such ICBMs do influence the United States' so-called indications and warnings efforts. Solid fuel ICBMs are known to be harder to detect and require less pre-launch preparation. Congressman Seth Moulton of the Democratic Party expressed similar concerns the same day, pointing out that the 11 ICBMs Pyongyang displayed in a military parade back in February show that the U.S. may not have enough missiles to intercept them to protect its mainland. Going into a short commercial break now, more news on the other side. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, Apple CEO Tim Cook is in India this week as he opened the first physical stores in the country, marking a milestone for the iPhone maker in the world's second largest smartphone market. Around 300 people lined up in Mumbai to celebrate the opening of Apple's first retail store in India. They were greeted Tuesday by Apple chief executive Tim Cook who took selfies and met one fan who brought with him a Macintosh SE model from 1984. People flocked to the store from across India, hoping to be among the first to enter in an opening event featuring local music and folk dancers. One fan said he was elated to get the CEO's signature. Apple has previously faced hurdles in opening physical retail stores in the South Asian nation, but its products have been available on e-commerce websites, while its online store opened in 2020. The new store opens as Indian consumers increasingly look to upgrade their smartphones to glitzier models. Still, Apple's pricey phones are affordable for only a few in India, where it accounts for just 3% share of the market. A second store in Delhi, the capital, is set to open on Thursday. Since the start of the Russia's invasion of Ukraine, there have been clear signs of increasing clampdowns on independent voices questioning the Kremlin. In the latest arrest, a Russian judge ruled that American journalist Evan Jerzhkovich must remain behind bars on espionage charges in a case that is part of a Kremlin crackdown on dissent and press freedoms amid the war in Ukraine. In a Moscow courtroom, looking tense and anxious and facing the cameras, Evan Gershkovitz is awaiting his appeal hearing and paces back and forth his future in the hands of a Russian judge. Prosecutors here claim he's an American spy. His newspaper and the US say it's a political show trial to crush questioning voices. Evan was detained on assignment in the city of Yekaterinburg in the Ural Mountains, then taken to Moscow accused of espionage over claims he tried to obtain classified defense information. The Wall Street Journal denies that and says he was covering the Russian mercenary group Wagner in the city. The journal and international colleagues describe him as a trusted and dedicated Russian-speaking reporter. The US Secretary of State speaking at the G7 summit in Japan said Evans' case is a priority. Ambassador Tracy and our chief consular officer uh, were able to see Evan uh, in, um, in prison uh, in Moscow. I can... Uh, report based on what Ambassador Tracy has said, uh, that he's in good health and good spirits considering the, uh, considering the circumstances. Since the start of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, there have been clear signs of the increasing clampdown on independent voices questioning the Kremlin. 
On Monday, the Russian dissident Vladimir Karamurzar, who criticised the Ukraine war, was jailed for 25 years on apparent corruption charges. And Putin critic and opposition rival Alexei Navalny is serving a nine-year term also on corruption charges. His condition is said to be deteriorating. Back in the courtroom, after a brief hearing, the court says it rejects Evans' appeal. He'll now face a full trial. The US says its special envoy for hostage affairs is now handling Evans' case and pushing for an end to his detention. There is developing news in Kansas City where a homeowner shot a black teenager at his door. The culprit posted a $200,000 bail just hours after turning himself in. The following visuals of this story is graphic. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. Tonight, police say the white homeowner accused of shooting a black Missouri teen who rang his doorbell, now out on bail after turning himself in to police. We are satisfied with the, uh, the charges that are brought uh, as charges. Obviously, we want to see it uh, through to a conviction and appropriate sentencing. 84-year-old Andrew Lester faces the possibility of life in prison charged with first-degree assault and armed criminal action for shooting 16-year-old Ralph Yarl in the head and arm after Yarl, hoping to pick up his younger brothers Thursday, accidentally went to the wrong home. Ralph says that he was shot through the screen door at point-blank range, and when he went to the ground, he was shot a second time. Meanwhile, new details on the homeowner's possible defense. Per a probable cause statement, Andrew Lester telling detectives he was in bed Thursday night when he heard his doorbell ring. Adding he picked up his gun and saw a black male approximately six feet tall pulling on his exterior storm door handle. Lester noting he believed someone was attempting to break in and shot twice, adding he was scared to death and the two exchanged no words. NBC News has made multiple attempts to reach out to Lester, but so far has been unsuccessful. Ralph's family says he only rang the doorbell and never tried to break in. The family's attorney says that Andrew Lester told Ralph, don't come around here before shooting him. The family says Ralph, wounded, ran for his life. <laughs> Meanwhile, more than 1,500 of his high school classmates rallying around Ralph today. Wearing blue, his favorite color, and willing his recovery along. We support you, Ralph. We want to be there for you. We want to let you know that we stand with you. Tunisian authorities have closed the headquarters of the Islamist-inspired opposition party a day after leader Rashid Hanouchi was arrested. First, its leader was arrested. And then, its headquarters were raided overnight in the capital, Tunis. In a clear violation of the freedom of political parties to operate and organize, Enacta's headquarters are currently being cleared out, in principle for a few days, in order for the authorities to search the premises. According to local news reports, the interior minister has banned meetings at Enahda offices across the country. The latest developments come a day after Enahda's leader, Rashid Ghanoushi, was arrested over charges of incitement. Official sources have confirmed that Ghanoushi's arrest was linked to recent statements he'd given to the media. Tunisia without Ennahda, without political Islam, without the left, or without any component of its political life, it's a recipe for civil war. It's a crime. The 81-year-old has been detained in the past and interrogated over charges including money laundering and funding terrorism. Since the start of February, the Tunisian authorities have arrested more than 20 political opponents and figures. Despite President Kayas Said's insistence that those who were detained are a threat to national security. We respect the law. We do not want to cause harm to anyone. But we will not leave the state as prey in their hands. His critics accuse him of using the fight against terrorism as an excuse to revive autocratic rule in Tunisia which was the sole democracy to emerge from the mass protests of the Arab Spring over a decade ago. Welcome back to World News Tonight. And for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. A four-story parking structure collapsed in New York City's Lower Manhattan near Pace University, killing at least one worker and injuring five others who were in the building. 
At least 21 people have been killed in a hospital fire at Beijing's Shangfen Hospital. Some patients climbed out of their own windows by tying together bedsheets to make ropes. At least 71 people have been rescued and the cause of the fire is still being investigated. Brazilian President Lula da Silva condemned the violation of Ukraine's territorial integrity by Russia and again called for a mediation to end the war, a peace initiative that was criticized by the Ukrainian government. United Nations humanitarian agencies warned 48 million people in West and Central Africa face acute food insecurity in the coming months, a 10-year high spurred by insecurity, climate shocks, COVID-19 and high prices. In a major conservation milestone, a zoo in Thailand's northeast region announced that it had successfully hatched a red-headed vulture, making it the first successful breeding of its species in Thailand in 30 years and only the second instance worldwide. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. As we end tonight, enjoy the blooming bluebell sprinkle spring magic in Belgium's enchanted forest that stays alive for a maximum of 10 days. Stay safe and have a good night.